Hey everyone, it's Jen. Welcome to the Done For Us podcast. We are joined by a very special guest today. Kristen, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing great. So glad to have you. You know, Katie and Done For Us, we talk about to be involved, to be a child advocate. You actually don't need to be some big, important person with letters after your name, with a big degree, with a big following. We're just saying you need to be an adult who cares about the rights of children. And so we'll hopefully have more conversations like this just with, we're going to call you an advocate. So a fellow advocate, just kind of a normal person in the world (laughs) who came across our information in some way and you decided to use it to inform others. So that's the conversation for today. We hope you all enjoy it. But Kristen, just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe kind of what part of the country you're in, who's in your family, some of those things. My name is Kristen Hall. I live in Southwest Missouri, and um, I come from a traditional Christian home. Uh, My parents will actually celebrate their 58th anniversary later this month. So um, I have a brother and sister and uh, who are both married and I have uh, uh, two nieces or three nieces and two nephews. So. Awesome. (laughs) Okay. And then how did you first hear about them before us? So um, I first heard Katie interviewed on Ali Beth Stuckey's podcast, Relatable, and I went back and looked in the archives and confirmed that was September 2021. And um, and it just totally blew my mind. Um, it, and it wasn't even shocking or any way, you know, I, everything she said just made total and complete sense. And it was just like, yes, yes, that's right. And I've never, ever forgotten that conversation. In fact, there's a, there's this a stretch of road near my house that I just remembered distinctly. I was driving along that stretch when I was listening to that conversation. And I almost always think about that conversation when I drive that stretch, which is pretty often. So, um, it just totally made sense. And so I just fell in love with your organization. And and I was just like, yes, uh, defending children is so important and, and it's over so many different issues, not just abortion or, or certain issues. It, it just covers such a wide swath of, of um, issues. So. Yeah. We love Allie. We're thankful that Katie was able to join her now a few times on her platform. Yeah. That's really cool. So were you raised within a faith tradition, within a political tradition where the pro-life and the marriage and family, that all was kind of a given to you? Yeah. Like I said, I was raised in a Christian home. So um, there's never been a time in my life when I haven't known who, you know, who Jesus is and everything and, um, and a conservative home at that as well. Um, I had always, I remember I first learned what abortion was in high school, which was in the mid nineties. And, um, and before that I had heard the word, but I didn't understand what it was. And then once I found out what it was, I thought that's the most horrible thing in the world. I just was just horrified that that's even a thing that would happen. And so I've really been pro-life ever since then. Um, My convictions have gotten a lot more stronger, especially in the last couple of years as I've learned more about it and everything. But um, pretty much from the moment that I found out as a teenager, I've I've been pro-life. So it sounds like you're kind of describing what... I would say a decent amount of our followers would say they sort of intrinsically knew that there were problems with things like maybe the more controversial sperm and egg don- donation, surrogacy, and then IDF. Maybe, you know, some people are still not sure where they land with that, or they are Christian and conservative and they affirm that it's good, like we're seeing. Mm-hmm. So maybe you've already kind of felt those things were wrong, but did you feel like you had ways to articulate it or could finally? could say why you thought it was wrong or is that what helped what Allie and and Katie's conversation kind of helped you do I've always innately knew it was wrong um I I, I'm a single I'm a single woman and um and I always wanted to be a wife and mom and so as I you know go through my 20s and my 30s and um and that's not happening for me I had, you know, I've seen other people, I've seen friends of mine who have struggled with fertility and they would go with the IVF route and everything. And there was just something about that that just didn't seem right. And I, and maybe I couldn't articulate exactly what was wrong with it, but for some reason it just didn't feel right. And I would also have people tell me too, hey, you know, you could do the IVF thing if you want to have a kid or you can, you know, adopt there. So I've, I've, you know, you know, I have, have thought about those options, but they never seemed right. And, and the number one reason was because, a child needs a father and a mother. And, and I could see the, uh, I could see the um, benefit of having my, my married parents in my, in my home, having my father. And I, 
just could never, ever do that to a kid. No matter how much as a child needs a home, I couldn't deprive them of one of the parents that they innately need. So, yeah. And so then once I heard Katie articulate what, now that I've learned so much more about the issues and everything, it's just, okay. And now, now I understand why I, why I felt that way and everything. So, yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> really thankful for that and I feel like even as someone who's worked for them for us now for a number of years I was learning you know as I was going along more and more about the topics how to and IVF really has blown up in the last few years or even just months and mm -hmm. so I think a lot of the more conservative Christian side is really having to wrestle with how we're going to articulate it why it's wrong or at least what are the ethical questions involved mm -hmm. with it right is there a resource that you would say was the most beneficial for you? Was it YouTube videos with Katie speaking? Is it podcast, book, website, anything like that that's kind of stood out to you as you've gone on this journey? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, mainly the book and the articles um, that, that Katie has written throughout the years. And in fact, probably before that conversation she had with Allie in 2021, I had probably read some of her articles in The Federalist. I just hadn't put the two and two together. So, um, but yeah, when I was listing out my resources, uh, when I, uh, when I did a re presentation recently and everything, most of it was articles in the book. Um, and I think the two most important articles that Katie has written is the, um, the conservative pro-life case against surrogacy that she wrote back in, in December. And then the Christian conservative case that she had written, I think that was like in March or April of this year. Those were, those are the two that I share the most often with people to understand, uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it, especially if they're Christian or conservative. So yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'll try to find those resources and make sure they're in our show notes too, just so we can be able to check them out. Mm -hmm. Everyone should mm -hmm. have the book by now though. Come on. No. Yeah. But um, <laughs> well, and yeah, you know, we, we like to say the Done For Us book really is, we'll get comments that say, do you have any citations for that? Do you have any studies for that? And it's like, we have a book full of those things trying to do, right. trying to have a one-stop shop, one-stop place for all the, the resources that we've gathered over time. So if you don't have the book, you know, folks, go grab the book. Great resource. Yes. Uh, okay, yeah, so tell us a little bit about the presentation. That's kind of how I came to know you. You reached out to us, and you're just expressing, I think, thankfulness for the resources and saying, hey, I am, I'm doing a presentation using this content. And so as a team, we were really excited just to know. It's hard to know sometimes, are we making a difference or not? You know, we're kind of shouting out into the interwebs or whatever. And so <laughs> it's really neat to hear someone, like we're saying, advocates on the ground that to the world are not, you know, big influencers, significant, whatever, but you are significant because you have a reach and a group of people you're influencing that we don't know about. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about whatever the presentation was that you did and, and how you prepped for it. Maybe how, how that went, what was the response? So I am a, a part-time student at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and um, that's primary, pr primarily an online uh, school out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And they um, they specialize in Christian apologetics. So um, I am pursuing a master's level certificate in uh, culture, Christianity, and apologetics. So um, awesome. I've I've kind of just to kind of backtrack a little bit and everything. The Lord has just kind of had me on a on a journey for the last few years to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. Um, <laughs> I always wanted to be a wife and mom, and that's not what the Lord had for me. And so a few years ago, you know, he's just like, let's figure out what you really want to do and everything. Because I started working for my company 22 years ago, and I didn't expect to still be here 22 years later and everything. And so, um, and that has been a, a huge process. And so part of that was, um, was uh, I realized that I wanted to do something that would defend the rights of children and um, or uh, engaging the culture from a Christian perspective uh, in issues specific to uh, to children and everything and that affect children like abortion or or the fertility issues, gender ideology, anything that affects children. And so obviously that's what I was interested with you guys, uh, but also with getting into that field, I mean, with I've been in the corporate world, so I don't necessarily have, you know, other than my service in church and volunteer and stuff like that, I don't really have a lot of, you know, to, uh, to back that up. And so I wanted to get some more education just to, um, uh, just to beef up the resume and just to learn more and everything. And it has been huge. So last semester I took a, uh, Christian ethics class 
And that changed my world. (laughs) I just loved it. I mean, we were, you know, we talked about the foundations of ethics and everything. And then in the second half of the semester, we really got into the issues. And so every class, every week, we were talking about a different type of a different issue. And one of the assignments for that class was to do a paper or a presentation or presentation on an ethical issue from a Christian perspective. And so I had first thought about doing the entire them before us perspective, no. And then I realized that was way too much of a behemoth. <laughs> and it was funny because after I finished my presentation, I heard uh, I heard Katie on on a podcast, and she said how she uh, she had mentioned how every chapter of the book could be its own book because it's oh, such yeah. a huge topic. And I was like, okay, that's that makes sense, and that's why I couldn't do the entire <laughs> argument. But I decided to focus on IVF and surrogacy. Um, and that really set what really solidified that for me was the Alabama State Supreme Court decision that happened in February. And I was just baffled at the response that we saw from the Christian and conservative world. And um, and just to remind people, the Alabama State Legislature, which is pro-life and, and majority Republican, they immediately acted uh, because all the that one of the major fertility, fertility clinics had closed down because they didn't feel that they could protect embryos all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, um, and so the legislature moved to, you know, to basically give them blanket immunity. And the pro-life governor, Republican governor, signed it into, into legislation. And I was just baffled by that. I was like, wait a second here. Do you really know what you're doing? And so um, that just kind of drove me any f- even further to do the presentation on that. So, and I wanted to do primarily sur- uh, surrogacy. But obviously, IVF and surrogacy are just so intertwined. You can't mm-hmm. talk about one without the other. And so I sure. did that specifically from a children's rights perspective. So awesome. Did you have any pushback from your classmates? Would you say so? This was uh, you're in an online class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't have any pushback. Um, and, and we didn't give it to the entire class. It was just turned into the professor. So he saw it, although I did share it with my classmates and everything, but, um, uh, but yeah, being at a, in a Christian seminary and everything or a Christian Bible college and everything, we're, we're all like-minded. So there's no, uh, no pushback oh, from the classmates. So <laughs> that's great. Well, we were pointing out as a team that, uh, Katie's, maybe that was one of the articles you mentioned when she wrote for Christianity Today. Um, the Christian yes. case against surrogacy. We yes. got, I mm-hmm. mean, the majority of the pushback in the comments, at least, were people identifying as Christians and often saying either they used a surrogate, they had been a surrogate, or they used IVF or whatever it was. And it was just lambasting her. And I think maybe not even going and reading the article. I mean, social media, of course, sometimes that will happen. It'll just go off the post. But mm-hmm. our primary pushback with IDF and surrogacy, because our most of our audience is conservative and Christian, has been from conservatives and Christians. Yep. So that's always kind of interesting. Well, and it would be interesting um, if or when you're able to maybe make a presentation like that to a group of people, like two college students or something. and. And mm-hmm. see how that goes, because I think maybe this is your experience, too. It, do, it does seem like a lot of people haven't considered the questions. Right. Or they think it's wrong, but if they were pressed, well, what mm-hmm. if it's just someone doing it for their sister or a yeah. mom doing it for their daughter-in-law? You know, like we've seen all these interesting altruistic. All those exceptions, uh, cases. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Edge cases, right? As we like to yes. say. Things you, you know, oh, what was there just a story about a... The husband died, and so the woman they you they got his sperm after he died. You have like forty eight hours or something. Like I don't really want to get into or know mm-hmm. how they go about doing that, but yeah. you know, so she can do IVF, and I mean, she's implanting it into herself. But again, these ethical questions where we well, feel bad, right? That's her dead mm-hmm. husband. How's she ever going to have his children if we don't do these technologies, right? But. We always say we have to reframe the thinking to from the child's perspective, not the grieving widow, not the sad, you know, his parents who want to be grandparents and have a replica of their son again. But Mm -hmm. what's the child's perspective? Well, you're intentionally making a child that's fatherless because the father has died. So there's questions there. 
Yeah. And I did, I posted the, so I recorded the conversation and posted it to YouTube and I shared it on, um, on social media. So my Facebook and Instagram are private, but that was obviously to friends and everything. And then I, I posted it to X, which is public. And that's where I tagged you guys and you guys found out about it too. And, um, so, uh, but I did, ha I was one, you know, I did wonder, especially posting it to, fa to Facebook. I'm like, okay, you know, I, not everybody's going to agree with this. What am I going to get and everything? And, um, I didn't get any pushback whatsoever, which of course, I mean, that might be the Facebook algorithm blocking it too. Who knows? So, <laughs> it was but it. I did, I yeah, I did get a, a right. I did get a friend who, um, who commented and, um, and she, she watched the entire thing and she actually herself had gone through IVF. And so mm -hmm. she had a very thoughtful perspective on it. And, um, and actually it was really good. She, um, so she and her husband are in, you know, they've, they did IVF and they have, they have three of their four children are IVF. Their fourth one was a miracle. They, they conceived on their own. Uh, but they did, you, I, from what I understand, they used both their, their own egg and sperm. They didn't use a donor or a seller. So, um, but she did mention it and she said that they, you know, that they intentionally tried to do it as ethically as they could. Like she was, went into it well aware of, of the ethical issues with it. And, but they do have, a, a few embryos that are left over from it. And, um, but she said that they have put them up for adoption and, um, and she's made an open adoption too, so that if they are adopted out, then, th then she and her husband will be able to be found by the child if they, you know, if they search for them and that sort of thing. So, right. um, given that they've already been through the situation, you know, and right. I think she, if I remember the, the comment correctly, I think she even said if she could go back, she would have created less embryos and only done the ones that she was going to implant because of what the, the situation that they're in now. So, yeah. um, so I really appreciated that feedback from her specifically and everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, mm -hmm. I like to think too, that a lot of our advocacy ends up being on social media. You know, some people feel differently about it. They think we shouldn't put politics or faith or those things on your social media. It's going to create drama with friends and family and there's wisdom for sure. <laughs> It, but I also think even if, let's say, someone who was more hostile had commented and you kind of go back and forth, it, those kinds of things, a debate is really for the people who are watching. It's generally mm -hmm. not for the two people who are making an argument because you right. kind of are established. But there's a lot of silent, you know, the lurkers on social media who are taking things in and they're watching the arguments play out and they're kind of making the decision. Mm -hmm. So whether we see feedback one way or the other. It is great that those are the kinds of, you know, making a presentation, sharing it on your social media is helping people think. And we talk about that with even folks sharing our social media posts. Um, you know, a lot of people maybe feel nervous about that because you are going to have people who respond. But you can always, even if you don't love the way we say something or it feels a little too black and white, someone could share it and say, this is interesting. What do you think about it? You, know, mm -hmm. you can really frame things through your own social media to just start a conversation and have people maybe start considering the ethical questions. So that's really neat. I think that you shared it, especially, I don't know how it's going to go. It's, you know, when it's time to get it's a little different, maybe than just public on Twitter. Like, yeah. This. And I, I am so non-confrontational. So that like scare, scares me, you know, but at the same time, I, I have no doubt the Lord is calling me to speak into the culture and everything. I think that's what Christians need to do now because we are in a very hostile culture and everything. And if we don't start speaking truth into it, um, it's, it's not going to turn out good. And so I think it's our responsibility as Christians to, to speak, to speak the truth in love and to, uh, try to, to help people understand, um, uh, what the Christian view is and everything and how we can be salt and light to a, a dark, dark world. So, yeah. That's a great mm -hmm. point. Okay, Kristen, final kind of question. What are the maybe next things you're thinking about doing? Not not related to them for us specifically, but you said you you were interested in the topics, all the things that pertain to the well-being of children. Like them before us doesn't particularly talk about trans ideology and some of those things because a lot of great voices are pushing back. But what are right. what's kind of the dream for you of of where you would want to go next? Hey, you're gonna have letters after your name eventually, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now it's only a certificate, so it's not that big of a deal, but I could go on to get a master's or whatever if I decide to. But, um, you know, the the turning point for me was, I remember summer of, of 2022, um, you know, Roe Ro versus Wade was overturned at that point and everything. 
And, um, and I woke up and at, in the aftermath of that, I realized that the pro-life industry really, really didn't seem to have a plan for it getting overturned. And, um, so that kind of opened my eyes to what's going on there and, and how to, uh, how to approach that, that subject of abortion and everything. But I had a moment one night that summer that, um, I was, um, I just had a really, really hard time and everything. And, and I've come with, I'm come to peace with, being a single woman and not having the marriage and the family that I've, that I've always wanted. But I had a moment in the middle of the night and I was just crying out to the Lord. And I said, and I was like, Lord, why did you give me such a huge, um, such a huge desire for children if you weren't going to give me any of my own? Mm. And the answer became so clear. He said, so you will fight for them. Yeah. And he's um, like, and that's what, and if you had your own children, you would not be able to fight for them the way I need you to fight for them. And I'm like, okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and so, um, and so I just see all these different areas that children are being um, hurt. And I truly believe that there is a war on children going on. And if um, in our culture and our world are trying to destroy children, and if they can't destroy them before they're born, then they're going to destroy them after they're born. Um, and then after they're born, that's going to be through gender ideology or the indoctrination that is happening and everything, or even through pornography and trafficking and, and just all of the issues. So um, I don't know specifically. I just know that I need to be somewhere in that realm and speaking truth into it from a Christian perspective. And so it's kind of open ended and begets a specific, a specific all at the same time. So I'm just trusting in the Lord to guide me in in the ways that He wants me to go, and and in His perfect timing, uh, end up where I'm supposed to be. So yeah, I love that. Well, thanks so much for sharing and for your vulnerability. You know, I'm single woman as well. I've shared my story on the podcast. There's if you have the book Get Married by Brad Wilcox or heard of it, I, I was it's sharing on my yesterday. list. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh there's a lot of great news in it for some of it. When it's like, hey, if you're single at 30 whatever, chances are you're never getting married, you're never having kids. And I was like, bummer. Wow. But you know, for people within the Christian faith too, our happiness and, and our purpose is not solely in marriage and family. We tell we're part of this larger family of faith family god's family and he has mm -hmm. a purpose for our lives regardless of are we gonna get married are we gonna have kids but at the same time we don't know that's timing for those big gifts you might give us as well so i love your posture of you can ask you're being faithful you're doing what god's calling you to do and we know he's gonna use your life he's i'm sure using your voice to just bless people even right now we're listening so yeah. thanks so much for saying, yeah go ahead I know. I was just going to say, there was a moment in my life a long time that I, I did not take that well. And hmm. to the point where I made marriage and children an idol. And so, um, and that left me and I actually ended up, I, I did get married and I was married for a year hmm. and, um, that was not the right marriage to be in. My, my husband left me after a year and everything. And looking back, I can see the warning signs, but, um, but it was through that my, this world that I built for myself, you know, coming crashing down around me that the Lord saved me out of that and everything. And that's when I truly surrendered my life to him and, and realized, okay, this isn't what you have for me. And, um, as, as important as marriage and children is, it's, um, it's not necessarily guaranteed for everybody. It's the, you know, the Lord has a plan for each individual person and, um, and submitting to that and the plan that he has is, is really, really important. So, yeah, that's a good word. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for Thank representing you. them before us, just advocating for kids in your just everyday normal life. God's going to use you. So we're thankful. Thank you, Jen.